Okay, we are uh, recording with Michael DeZormo and Nick Carazza. Nick, not and, Nicholas? What no, happened? not Nicholas. I'm 2024, just starting off on a fresh foot. And uh, But I did, you know, we, we were talking about this before. I'm not going to mention when or why, but we were talking about before. And 2024 is off to a great start because in 2024, Mike DeZormo doesn't put cream or milk in his coffee. No, no, you don't put sugar in your coffee. I don't put cream or sugar. Okay, because I just want everyone listening to know that Mike used to drink his coffee not too long ago, and it shocked me. He, we have beautiful coffee here with beautiful organic beans. It's, it's a beautiful machine that's making these coffees. And then he would get sugar and dump all this sugar in there, and then he would get cream, <laughs> dump all this cream in there. And I said, Mike, if you want a candy bar, I'll go buy you a candy bar, but don't try and turn your coffee into a candy bar. Plus, you're ruining the beautiful coffee that we're getting here. And then, Mike, you know what he did? He immediately, I think that day, stopped putting sugar in his coffee. Were you like a Tim Hortons double double? Did you ever do triple triple? Oh, yeah, he did. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> Shamefully, probably. Yes. Yeah. But then, what was, why did you just stop the sugar? Because what you said. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what else now uh, called him on his manhood yeah yeah because yeah. yeah. i think you called him a baby right yeah i know oh, i said that's for kids yeah i go yeah. that's how kids would drink coffee yeah you're not a kid so now you don't drink coffee like, great we made progress in 2023 <laughs> so in 2024 just you know what you guys we're all using the hydrogen water bottle thing why are we using this thing again what does it do? None of us really yeah, know. Well, it goes beyond the filtered water, which if you don't get filtered, which I've learned this year, which I wasn't paying attention to, is all the but birth wh- control and antidepressants and whatnot that's in our water. Which but why do you, no you have the filtered water to begin with if you, that's, like, if you didn't know about that stuff? Oh, you just hear that you should filter <laughs> you your water, go, but I didn't know. <laughs> but you were filtering I, your water oh, yeah, at home. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, Reverse yeah, osmosis, yeah, yes, like triple very, filter system. Yes, very good system. Okay. Yeah. And now the hydrogen water infuses hydrogen into that filtered water, also takes out the chlorine, also takes out the ozone. So it's even... Because you better, does, it, does it actually take out chlorine and stuff? I didn't know that part. Well, yeah. uh, to what extent? I don't yeah. know, but yes. Okay, yeah. like we bought this thing. We got this thing. You no, know, Nick got us the, these things for Christmas. Do we even know though if there's any hot? Like, do we know if it's working? Because when no, I turn on this a, thing, it's, it's, there's fifty yeah. percent chance it's absolute poison. There's just bubbles yeah. that come up in the bottle, yeah. and then we drink the water. Yeah, but don't you feel better after? <laughs> I think because I was thirsty <laughs> before, and so okay. I drank water, so I do yeah. feel better. That, that's fair, but also. Um, it's been years now after, you know, you know me, like if I'm going to drink, I'm not a casual uh, wine guy after dinner. Well, I have a glass of wine. If we're going to drink, we're, we're going gonna to drink, right? We're going. Uh, soldiers. Yeah, the soldiers all are going. going. Yeah. <laughs> so for years now, if we're going next day, I'm paying for it. Yeah. I, I rob tomorrow for the price of that day, right? By excessively drinking. Anyways, long story short, with the hydrogen Just water. Say, for the record, yeah. Mike, yeah. it is fun. Yeah. Like it is yeah. Oh, fun. yeah. I'm not, <laughs> not doubting that. Yeah, for sure. Are we allowed to tell the Backstreet Boys soldier story? Or no, no. No. So... Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so sorry, sorry. The hydrogen. Oh, water. Yeah, over the holidays, excessive drinking happened, and with the hydrogen water, felt like a champ next day. That's never happened for you, and I cannot attribute anything else to it other than the hydrogen water. Like, oh. Nothing else changed. Okay, was Doctor Cowan telling you something about this that when you were no. drinking regular water, when you saying yeah. you were having a lot of water, oh, just, yeah, you yeah. were just peeing sorry. it right out? I think I made the comment to you guys. Yeah, like yeah. with the hydrogen water, uh, just regular water. I'd have to go to the washroom a lot more if I'm consuming more water. And then with the hydrogen water, so Carolyn said, it's like, I'm like, why, don't, why do I have to keep urinating after I drink a lot of water? He's like, oh, you're like a dried out plant where your, your body's not absorbing it. With the hydrogen water, the body's definitely absorbing it. And I have more uh, weight as a fact, as a, yeah. as a result of that. So you're like, I'm holding on more water. water. Yes. I found the yeah. same thing for sure. Hmm. Because I, because it's one of the reasons, you know, everyone's like, oh, you need to drink, what, what is it, two liters, two gallons? I don't know, whatever, some two something of water every yeah. day. I'm like, no, you just drink when you're thirsty. Yeah. And um, so I probably doesn't, don't get that optimized amount. But, but then, because uh, I found whenever I drink water, it wouldn't even take long. And I didn't have to drink a lot of water. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, how do I, so I, I, I asked people in the office, I'm like, because Ashley walks around with her big like water mm-hmm. drink. I'm like, how do you drink that much water? I would live in the bathroom. Yeah. But this stuff, I found the same thing. I don't know if it's placebo or what. But I'm just like, huh, I'm drinking more water, especially when I first got it and started playing with it. I was like drinking it. I'm like, I'm not having to go to the bathroom the yeah. same way. It was, we- yeah. it was weird. Yeah, that was weird. And I swear the water so we think feels, the different, feels different, feels different. And it's mm-hmm. not just, I know D- uh, Dai was saying the same thing. So I, 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 part of me thinks it's guaranteed placebo effect. But then part of me is like, I don't know, I feel like something's actually different. And then just to go back. So Sarah's now taking it. And then the three kids, five, the ages seven, five and two 
even the baby now is asking for this water. No, the baby's not, not verbally. Yeah. <laughs> He's making his gestures and grabbing the bottle from me and wants me to, he wants to consume Do they just water. like the color? Is that why? No, I, I don't know. I think our bodies know what they want. Like I It's like this. when I first started eating butter from not eating mm. butter, I went through two years of my body was just, I couldn't eat enough butter. Right. It wanted all the fat I could get. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I can see some validity there. Yeah, I'm worried about you because if you buy into this thing, you're going to buy 15 of these bottles. You're going to have one <laughs> everywhere you go and every single day. And mm -hmm. that, that's it. You're going to OD in hydrogen for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I'm a little bit obsessive. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. We got into real estate investing and there, there's a brokerage now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we got into that and then you went all out on the Juve light recently. Yeah. Yeah. The Juve lights, that infrared light and non, non, no, wait, near infrared that isn't visible to the eye in infrared light. Mm -hmm. And um, you know what? It was that podcast with Dr. Brecca on the Joe Rogan podcast when he's talking about Dana White and how much blood flow and circulation and how healthy it is for you to get some infrared light because I think that's more superficial. But then the near infrared light, if I'm remembering correctly, goes deeper and can act as an anti-inflammatory mechanism in your body. And then there's like a pulsing wave that like they've discovered if you pulse near infrared light, it actually even is better for anti-inflammatory effects on your body. Um, Apparently, so, same with the hydrogen water is good for inflammation and you're immune. They say weight loss too. I don't know how, but yeah. Well, that one's not working on you. You, 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 <laughs> dude, you, you gained weight. You just <laughs> said you, water. Dude, you just said you called gained five pounds. <laughs> yeah. You just called them fat. Well, no, Carl's Carl's Mike's, not, Mike's not Carl's fat, but no, he just said it's good for weight yeah. loss. But he just told me he gained five pounds. <laughs> How's it working? Because what kind of weight loss is this? You go, uh, but it's like you know what this is like when we do a hundred calories on the assault bike at the gym. And I hate it, but I do it because Mike does it. And then uh, Mike comes in and he goes, Tom, we're going to do something new. I figured out a new thing. It's going to be a bit easier for us. Instead of 100 calories on the assault bike, we're going to do 200. And I'm like, Mike, I don't understand what universe you operate in. But if 100 sucks, I have no idea how 200 is easier or any better. So I'm used to Mike kind of using these <laughs> kinds of things. But then in his defense, we did 200 and it was a bit easier because we went slower. I think my theory was... <laughs> When we're doing a hundred, once you get to 50, it feels tough. It's like, oh, I got another 50 to do. But if we're doing 200, your first hundred feels easy. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, find, I find, no, no, it worked. It totally actually I just got worked. Brain fucked. It, no, 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 you didn't. It worked. You know what? No, it's, it's the reverse <laughs> totally for did. me. No, it's the totally. reverse for me. It's the first 100 suck. And then on the yeah. back 100, I'm like, oh, we're over halfway. Yeah. It's easier. So I'm you, you one, suck too. on the first half. I always think the first half. No, you, you hate the ba back half of anything we're doing. Uh, yeah, I always kind of, hate yeah, the yeah, first yeah. half. Yeah. Cause yeah. on the back half, I'm like, I'm almost done. Right. Right. <laughs> All yeah. I hear is someone's complaining during the whole time. That means yeah, I can't, yeah. someone's sucking out in the first half. No, no. The thing is at the gym, time. Mike doesn't complain. He's a silent assassin, man. He just does it. Yeah. Whereas I complain, I hate everything and then we'll do it. But, uh, all right. So anyway, but uh, you know what else that we're, you no, know, you and I are doing that I think Nick is not, he have a different pillow, is the sleep eight pillow. Oh, yes. So tell everyone about the sleep eight pillow. It's the way to get started to optimize your sleep. Start with the pillow <laughs> from sleep eight. Every time he talks about it, I feel like he works <laughs> this, for the company. Uh, this podcast yeah. is sponsored by, by sleep, sleep eight. eight. <laughs> not available in Canada, yeah. by the way. The pillow stays cool. Um, I don't know about you guys, but in the middle of the night without this pillow, I'd be flipping up my pillow to get it to the cooler side because the side that you're laying on gets heated. And if you're doing that, you're waking up and you might not, and you might not consciously be aware that you're waking up, but if you're making that movement, your, your brain is waking up. It's taking you out of deep sleep. So somehow this sleep eight pillow is cool throughout the night. There's no devices attached to it. It's infused by carbon, whatever technology they have behind it is is incredible. It's an expensive pillow. It almost costs as much to get it shipped here to Canada, unfortunately. If you, I hear it inf infused by carbon and I just got hit in the face with a piece of BS. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's a really great yeah, pillow. It's, it's a really yeah. great pillow. I'm yeah. not going to lie. He got me to get the pillow. Yeah. Start with I, the pillow. Yeah. And then if you're good with the pillow, you get the mattress cover where you have a tower, water tower off to the side of your bed. It's completely silent. It's independently temperature controlling each side of your bed. And uh, it's adjusting as you sleep to maximize your sleep to try to keep you into deep sleep. It also has these other little like analytics of when you wake up, you can see how well you slept. Wonder, but you, were you sleeping good before? Like, because we, yeah. we talked before. So like my, yeah. my REM and deep roughly what, 25 to 30 on average, yeah. it could be anywhere from 20 to 30, you know, ranges, but it's, it's mm -hmm. decent as a percentage of the time yeah. asleep. Did yeah. you, you were sleeping decently before, weren't you? Quite decently. This, I would say took it up a notch, but remember I used to work in sleep medicine. So I always thought I slept well. Well, 
until I hooked myself up to the electrodes, respiratory bands and all that kind of stuff. Went to sleep, watched the videotape later and, and, and the data. I had sleep apnea back then, which I had no idea. Sleep apnea is when you stop breathing in your sleep. Carbon builds up in your blood, oxygen's decreasing. You get to a point where your brain clicks in and it's like, I gotta get this guy breathing again. So you start breathing again, but you might not be aware of it throughout the duration of your sleep at night. And that's why a How lot of people- How did you fix that? Um, there's a couple ways to do it, which I didn't do. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's crazy. Uh, yeah, there's, there's, so some, it wasn't, I, th this wasn't my issue, but the majority of people that have sleep apnea, it's a result of uh, excess weight. Uh, a night of heavy drinking can also mm. cause that because your tongue gets relaxed, it slips to the back of your throat, so that can prevent uh, you from breathing properly. Um, I didn't do anything to fix it. There's medication, there's laser surgery on your throat. Do you there's, think you still have it now? Uh, no, I don't, I don't think. Uh, the, the, the only way you would know is if a significant other talked to you and said, hey, in yeah. the middle of the night, it sounds like you're, you're, you're gasping for air. Okay, and Are, Sarah's not saying yeah, that. Exactly. I don't think you have yeah. it. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, or if I do, it's not as bad maybe. But yes, yeah, so, uh, if you sleep on your back, you're more likely to have that issue. If you're uh, like a, a, a side sleeper or sleep on your stomach, a little less likely. Hmm. Okay, so, so sleep eight, yeah, you're doing, so have you given blood yeah. yet? I've not done that yet. You've recommended that. That was just the yeah. best one for me when Dr. Cowan said, what was it? It was something related to, I was my ferritin, was ferritin yeah. or something level. My was mm -hmm. high and he asked if I had given blood and I had never given blood. Like I hadn't mm -hmm. really given blood. I don't know if that, that's totally embarrassing to admit. I hadn't given blood. And he said, uh, okay, go give blood four times within a, you know, I think I did it within six months. And then he rechecked my blood again and he said, yeah, you're, it's like, all good and i felt like i noticeably felt better i thought and um he said it was just that you know modern men don't bleed you're not cutting yourself you're not out there doing stuff in the, in the, in the wilderness i guess and there's no release for a buildup of excess ferritin in your blood i hope i'm summarizing that properly and he said this is one way to kind of just be proactive and clean that up mm -hmm. um so now I do it twice a year, and I feel like that's just this little hack that for me is really great. And sorry, what what does the excess fair didn't do? It's just uh, an inflammatory, okay. I don't know if it's like a substance or inflammatory marker of some sort Got it. that couldn't wasn't coming down um, with just different changes to my diet. So mm. he wanted to try this approach. Right. And then it came, it came way down when he retested my blood. I think it took me about six yeah. months to go four times. And then I slowed down because I think he said that my iron level was in the proper range, but it was now like at the lower, you know, at the lower part of the range. Mm -hmm. So don't keep giving blood that, that often. So now I just go twice. Now it's a habit. I just go like twice, uh, twice a year. I'm actually due to go. And do you right notice now. a difference? I feel at first time, I definitely felt like recovery from the gym was better. I just felt overall better, like an overall m m more well-being. Um, that's not a proper sentence, but you know what I'm mm. saying. Um, yeah. I might try that. You felt better. I, yeah, yeah, we felt got it. No, we got I felt it. better. No, I was trying to think. Yeah, it was just, it's just overall, I felt better. Yeah, weird. And then it was measured in the blood. Right. Um, so anyway, and then anything else? Doctor, any Dr. Cowan appointments coming up? I have one in February. Mm -hmm. No. Because I want the one in February to talk to him about what we heard from Dr. Brecca on the Joe Rogan show about methylfolate. Because mm -hmm. I want him to take my 23andMe DNA results and see if we can figure out what... I'm, you remember in that podcast, they were talking about the four deficiencies that you, yeah. you, you likely have? So I wanted to see if we can nail that down. Mm -hmm. um, Cool. Nick, you're not seeing Dr. Cowan for anything coming up. No. Sounds like you guys are just too much work for me. What are you doing? I go to the gym. It's more simple. I eat. Yeah, yeah. I try to eat good and go to the gym. <laughs> yeah, but then you also found that- I like take fish oil. Does that weeks, count? Fish you, oil? Does that, does that count? <laughs> but, but you also found that maybe you weren't sleeping enough in the, over the holidays. You found that you were sleeping- Yeah, I, I think I've known that for a, a while that I just, I don't sleep enough. I, I can, I'll push through. I mean, I think on average I'm, I'm, I'm six to six and a half hours and it's just not enough. I, I need seven. At seven, I'm not too bad. And, and then now I know, because Cowan told me the same thing. He goes, I guess some of the latest research, or this is what he was telling me that whenever he told it to me, was that uh, the majority of the benefits of sleep are actually after seven. Remember how they used to say mm. eight? He's like, nah, se seven, it looks like is he gives it to you. And I, I wasn't, I was like six. So by the end of the week, I'm pretty, I'm pretty drained. Mm -hmm. Right. But it's not just that. The other thing that I've noticed was that I just, um, what helps me and I don't really do it, but I've noticed when, when it does happen that helps is, uh, time to just sit and chill. 
and relax makes a difference. And I notice, like like throughout the week, if I'm running, you know, if I'm working during the day, running around with the kids at night, that type of stuff. And it's just like, even though I might just be driving someplace, it's not really like a lot of exertion or it's not physical activity or something. Because you don't get that time to just chill and unwind, it, it's not just the sleep. I feel like you need sleep combined with like a little bit of calm time. That's foreign to you, right? Yeah, I, I don't do that. I mean, I mean, even <laughs> when we were in Collingwood on, uh, you know, over the holidays, I'm like, you don't sit still. Oh, well, you were there. Yeah, yeah. you guys. I'm like, I don't know. Okay, I'll be back. I'll go do here. I just, it's not. Uh, and you don't do coffee. No, because if I drink coffee, look, man, you, <laughs> you already don't sit still. So. Yeah, yeah. When I drink coffee, it's a it's an interesting scenario. I uh, plus it, it gets me coffee gets me cranked up like like I'm so I'm good. And then when I crash, you mean I, cranked up more? Yeah, yeah. And then I get all jittery and stuff like that. Like it, yeah. I crash off coffee hard. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but that's like me with everything. Like even when I was younger, when when I when I smoked weed when I was younger, it was the same thing with my my friends. I mean, they like I I didn't I smoked weed, but not a ton of like. I had some friends that like they smoked weed, you know, like it was a lot. And our, our next door neighbor was like sent the benchmark from oh, Saga. Yeah. <laughs> so God knows what, what they were smoking, but like, I was like, it would hit me really hard and then I would crash after. And that's probably why I didn't like it. Cause I was basically useless for the rest of the day. When I came down, I was mm. like, just, I was just like completely drained. Like I couldn't function as a human. Whereas these guys, some of them could smoke weed and they would like, they would function almost better in a way. I'm like, that's how do you do that? Like, I'm done. So, coffee has the same thing. I get a real high, and then I just crash low. So, coffee. So then you're working out five days a week, six days a week, six, six days a week, and then like kind of. You, you think you should pull back a little bit and get more sleep, get more rest? Like maybe it's just better for you. No, I don't think I, sh- I need to pull back on the working out. I think I need to pull. I, I need to just focus a bit on recovery, and mm. I'm just probably not. I don't do it till I'm forced to. He's still it's, young. <clears throat> He's young. It's the kids' yeah. ages, right? Because we're running with the kids a lot right now too. So because yeah. they're doing yeah. stuff, so it's just that. It's just that. But I, if I got a little bit more, the sleep helps. Like I, like I've t- I told you guys before, when I when I'm rested at the gym, it's weird because I feel like I tell them like guys, this is like a cheat code. I mean, mm-hmm. this is how you feel if you because some of the guys because they get they get up there and they get there early, like they're going to bed at like eight nine o'clock. I'm going to bed mm-hmm. at eleven or eleven thirty, and I'm getting there. You know, I'm there by six thirty. Mm-hmm. And these, I wonder if there's a cumulative benefit to sleeping earlier, though. Probably yeah. no, I think there is. But so these guys, I'm like, that's how much sleep you get, and th- you know, they're all rested. I'm like, it, you guys are cheating. Like, it's not even the same thing. I go, you need to be first of all, you're, you know, whatever, 15 years younger than me. Secondly, you don't drink wine every night, and third, you sleep. I mean, you guys are cheating, and just the fact that I can keep up is okay. <laughs> so that's <clears throat> that's what um, I got. So anything else, then, Mike? Before we, I want to get into the real estate stuff, but anything else on the health, fitness kind of side? that you're changing for this year, 2024? No, no. no. Steady with the gym time, steady with, we know sleep eight. The juve, sleep eight. Ju- juve, the juve and for light, how are you using it? You're turning it on in the morning in when you're morning. like shaving and yeah. stuff. Yeah, it's not the most ideal way. Yeah. yeah shaving, brushing my teeth. I've, the most ideal way is I, I would like to take that 10, 15 minutes in the morning and sit in front of it. Uh, it's just chaos though. When we wake up, the kids are- three young yeah, kids. Three young kids. So I have out, yeah. the six footer now that just arrived. Yeah. So I'm going to install nice. it this weekend, which is the two pieces that are six feet tall. So I'll, I'll set that up over the weekend. I learned that uh, duties and taxes, when you bring that into the country, are astronomical. Mm-hmm. So if anyone's going to order yeah. that, just and if anyone's going to ship one of these pillows in, I think the best service that we've used is reship.com mm-hmm. to get a U.S. mailing address for anything that won't ship into Canada. And then they, they will reship it up to, uh, to Canada for you. That's been a really good benefit to us because a lot of stuff you order in the U.S. has free domestic shipping. Mm-hmm. So once you get a U.S. mailing address, it's free to there. So you're only paying shipping once anyway. Right. But shipping that device over for whatever reason, I got smacked mm-hmm. with duties and taxes. Anyway, um, what are you seeing... In the, the real estate market, yeah, could you give everyone an update? We're early 2024 compared to the end of 2023. What are you seeing? How is activity it right was, now? As we were coming into December, things started to pick, pick up. Then January, the weekend of January 6th, 7th, when we were just coming out of holidays, things very noticeably start picking up in regards to showings on properties for sale, showings on properties for lease. And then this week, it's, again, noticeably different. So for the prior months at the end of 2023 it was quite slow out there for sale for lease and now it's it's picked up but this is at a time where historically it's slow december and Mm -hmm. january are not supposed to be busy they're supposed to be slow now weather impacts that as well and we haven't had the worst weather 
Yeah, usually these these months teeter off. December, January typically are slower months. Yeah. But it is, it is slow, like comparatively. Right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, it's not chaos, but I mean, it was much slower. Yeah, like gotcha. November coming into December, and then all of a sudden just start picking up again. Because hmm. um, most people are making their moves in come spring. Mm-hmm. But so what are you seeing in the market? Are people listing their homes? Yeah. Are people, oh yeah, like where are we in the, let's yeah. just focus on the starter home okay. category in some markets. Where yeah. are we on listings? Are people holding their price, dropping? So, What's going on? Yeah, so the, the sales that I think have flushed through are those people, those sellers that were willing to take, like I hesitantly say hit, because mm. they, 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 they didn't get the price that their neighbor got six months a year ago. And you know, it's, it's hard as a seller uh, because you're, 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 yeah, uh, your expectations. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're down. Right. So, um, properties are setting new benchmarks on sale prices, not for the better, for worse. And I think though, that that's the, a lot of those properties have flushed out. So it almost looks like we've reached this balance now in regards to property prices. I hesitantly say this cause this is early. This has only happened in the past few weeks because properties now I'm seeing less price reductions. There's the odd property that does sell for a bit more of a haircut than it should, but who knows the, 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 the motivation behind that sale. People, maybe they already bought something they desperately needed mm-hmm. to close. They're not going to hold out. A lot of people right now we're finding are holding out now. There's no Still more price, right now. price drops. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Then on the, the lease side, it was, it was quiet. And then um, like just yesterday, we dealt with a, a condo. This particular one was Toronto. So we had two condos that leased out yesterday. This particular one in Toronto, it's been on for, I w- would want to say a month. Consistent showings, mm-hmm. no offers. Then yesterday, three offers. Hmm. Yeah, it, it's, just, it's just getting busy. So the three offers were, um, uh, one didn't even see the unit. The agent put the offer in. Another were some people who just immigrated from Columbia um, so they're trying to get their, 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 one's going to school. It's a couple, one's going to school. The other's going to try to find a job. And then another one's a, a single mom. Long story short, this is something we haven't seen in a while. The, the people that immigrated over here, the, the Colombians, they, uh, willingly offered six months. So first month's rent plus last five months. That's something we haven't seen in a while either. That's how badly they wanted this unit hmm. in a market where there's excess condos for lease. There is a lot of people that bought condos with the uh, speculation. So why did you get three offers to, on this one? Yeah, well, it, Random. The price it's Islington and uh, the Queensway, so a great location. Um, it was a little cheaper, twenty one fifty, compared to the, the rest of the stuff that's out there. But uh, um, we're we're in a market where a lot of people that bought condos with the intent to sell weren't able to sell because it. They don't like what price they can get, so they're opting out to lease instead of sell. So we have a lot of condos out there for lease, not single family homes. There's not many of those, especially a whole home. A lot of these homes are being, as we mm-hmm. know, like divided up and put into multiple units. This single family home thing is going to get interesting mm-hmm. because of the new developments, like it's, mm-hmm. it's, 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 it's like there's going to be no more of them. Yeah, well, people just aren't, they're not developing them the same way. Primary one. Like we're going to see them being uh, developed, but they're just going to be more, well, more of a unicorn. Well, the, yeah, the numbers on them, if we look at the trend numbers on them, they're, they're flat, actually slightly trending downwards in Canada and in Ontario specifically. And if you look at the new, because, you know, they'll talk in the papers and things, you'll see headlines about the number of units coming onto the, we don't have a housing supply issue, some people feel, because of the, here's all the units coming onto the, um, onto the market. And well, yeah, there are a lot of units coming on, but the, the well, vast the majority. Bachelor condos. Yeah, they're tiny, some of, like, there's a lot One of bedroom, tiny yeah. condos, but, but the vast majority are condos. And I mean, that's, so if you're, but if you're bringing in a, you know, family of even, let's not call it a family of four, you know, the average is what what is it 2.1 is it 2.1 i thought it was Mm. Mm 2.4 no the average Mm -hmm. can't be Mm 2.1 that means like almost no one's having kids Mm -hmm. no that doesn't make that means 90 percent of people aren't having kids it's 2.1 i'll I'll google it oh because i guess there's a lot of single person households then yeah that's wow okay that's that surprises me i thought it was like mid twos but but they still won't um they don't have the places that for people to want mm-hmm. low rise. So there's just these demand issues. Yeah. Sorry, supply issues there. And I yeah. think that's what's going to happen because it's just, it's going to be condos like in, especially in like urban areas, it's basically become condos or nothing, you know, uh, or I shouldn't say nothing, but I mean that the gap is just pretty big between the number of units available. 2.1. Really? In Canada? Yeah, in Canada. 
That was a 2022 report. Wow. Statistics Canada. Fewer babies born as Canadians' fertility rate hits a record. Hits a record. What's the rest of it? Low in 2020. That's Big the report. fertility rate? So is that? <laughs> well, it's just saying it's 2.1. Mm-hmm. No, I'm just thinking with immigration coming in. Immig- like, what was the number? Is that the, that's the, house, the average household number in Canada. This one is the 2.1 children per, wo- per woman in Canada. Oh, so then that's like the the family size is larger than I was thinking the family size. Yeah, so I think that's fam- what they use for the family size. It's the same number reported differently. Yeah, but the family size is in two. It's either three or four. Oh, they do on average. So it can be 2.1. Because if you have some people like it's like family formations, just an average. How many two? How many three? How many four? Take the average it could be 2.1 if there's a lot of twos. Oh, okay. I thought that was the fertility thing that you're saying. That was. Yeah. But I think that's the number. I don't know. They're not breaking it out. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Got it. Last time I did look into family formation number, it was 2.1. But you're right. This is being reported as a, as a, as a replacement children per woman. So it's a different number. But to, to add to your point, Nick, I just got off the phone with my, with my brother-in-law. We helped him buy a property in Guelph. We severed the lot. So it was one lot, severed it into three. There's the intent is to build three custom homes there. Been going through the city for a while in order to get this is approved it's been finally approved so if you guys can hold on because they're debating do we act as contractors build for a buyer or do we build ourselves and sell and i just got off the phone i'm like if you guys can hold on build yourselves and sell i think you'll do much better more towards the end of the year only because yeah seeing the analytics and the purpose-built rentals and the condos coming online versus the single family homes the single family homes are tanking on top of that we talk to architects who design for builders who do the drawings that's one of the first steps if you're going to build a home you need the drawings these architects are not busy oh really that's interesting yeah <laughs> well what oh so then what are you telling them to what kind like what would because uh, i have something in my mind and i'm just curious mm-hmm. i don't want to lead you with 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 the to to I, i'm curious your opinion what w- what kind of property are you tell are you, you suggesting they buy uh, they built or mm-hmm. what are they looking at is it just a single family home for them like like yeah. uh, so a starter home type category uh, it'll be a, a a bit above a starter home so it'll be a four bedroom uh almost i think 2800 square foot modern farmhouse build okay so those are nice yeah what, then what yeah, about but, higher end yeah but what about putting a second unit in it like, are you going to put it, are you going to structure yeah. it so we've, that you could have that? Yeah, yeah, it's a really good question. Yeah. So we've discussed roughing for it because yeah. you just don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But roughing potentially are. Because it gives yeah. people the option, like, because, because I think it's going to change even from starter homes, like the value of being able to buy for someone to be able to buy a property and have that second as their own property and live mm-hmm. in one of the units and help offset some costs by renting a unit yeah. makes a difference. And even if they want to upgrade to that, because that's not really a starter home to like a little bit of a larger home once mm-hmm. they have kids. To have that option there to offset that, you know, I know some, for some people it could be a live-in nanny or in-laws or, or, you know, mother, yeah. some other family relative, but to have the option to be able to rent that, it does, it is a nice option for people, I think. So doing the rough-in would be smart in, mm-hmm. in today's world. It seems like that's almost a no-brainer to kind of do that. Yeah. Depending on costs and what end uses and stuff like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then just the student rental market is excessively busy yeah. uh, we have I t- spoke with a property management company where they, they just shut down taking any more requests they've have 50 groups that they have to find find houses for and they have no houses this is for the University of Western 50 and then groups 50 groups of kids yeah and then we have um, a gentleman who helps us here with insurance who was looking for his son who you guys know to uh, get a student rental in Guelph he was looking at rooms for rent they're exiting a house that they were looking at where the rent that was being asked by the owner was $750. The girls coming out said, we got it. We paid $1,000 per room. So rent being asked was $750. These girls paid $1,000. On average for Western, uh, Guelph, McMaster, rent per room is ranging anywhere from $800 all the way up to $1,200 per room. Now, colleges are about half that price. They're about $550 to $650. So colleges are different, but these universities, these strong universities in Southern Ontario, or eight, 800, 850 to 1200 a room. Yeah, one of ours that these people finally left, they uh, they were there for three years, I guess. So that's the natural kind of, by that time, they're, they're, they're pretty much done. Most of the time they're leaving after three years there. Mm-hmm. So we were, um, yeah, about mid 700s. And the girls that took it were, there's, there's seven rooms in this particular property. There was five of them. 
and they're like, look, we're, you know, we'll take it as a matter of like, well, there's, there's other rooms. You're gonna have to pay more if it's just five of you. Cause it's all kind of, you're all together on this lease. Right. And they're like, yeah, it's no problem. They're like, we might find other roommates, but if not, we're, ha- we're comfortable. Pay. It was, I think it works out to a thousand and fifteen bucks each, I think is what it was. Um, and they're like, yeah, no problem. It's great. They're yeah. comfortable. Yeah. They, and, and, the, and they took it. We didn't even get to the point of actually, we started running ads, but there was two people that knew people who were living in the house and they spoke well about the property managers taking care of it and us as owners, because they're like, hey, they're responsive mm-hmm. when stuff comes up, These, you know, they're, they're good people. So they, and they couldn't get a place elsewhere, well, they, they lost out. So they came through that back channel before we even showed it to the open market. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we let, we let them have it so we didn't have to go down and take care of any of that. So that they, they jumped on it. Yeah, and these are 12 month leases. So we've come to a point now where the room rental per month exceeds the tuition cost of a Canadian. If you're an international student, your tuition is probably going to exceed wow. the rental cost. But I didn't, I didn't think about yeah. that. Yeah. What's Tom, what's, what's tuition? What was, like, what's Aiden's tuition roughly? At Western, yeah. his tuition is around, I want to say, 7500 7, that's not any extras. You don't buy many books. Everything's online yeah. these days. So what's that? Six, six and change a month. Yeah, you're right. Mm. Wow. I figured it was like 20, 25,000 a year by the time you take in housing and food and a lot, you know, if you buy a new laptop and amortize that over a few years or whatever, I don't know. He rented a few years ago now or a couple of years ago. So he wouldn't be at these current markets. No, he's, he's a little bit He's more. like on the totally the cheap side. Yeah. It's a pretty beat down house. He's in at six fifty. I think he's six fifty. Look at Mike <laughs> laughing. <laughs> Mike can't believe the house Aiden's living in. <laughs> but they chose that. It, they chose yeah. that because that's the area where all his friends were. And that was the house that was available. But Mike, you know why? Because Mike, you do, the investors you work with at Western, they're buying like granite kitchen, oh pot light. Like these are beautiful. Some, en some, suite. Yeah. Okay, so. I've seen yeah, the, the, yeah. this house to be fair, it's, I don't know, is it a slum? It's a, yeah, you're going to say it's a slum house? Is it? Yeah, Mike's, Mike doesn't want to yeah, speak. It's, it's a slum. Uh, I'm, I'm surprised. Happy. I'm, ha- <laughs> I'm still happy Aiden's in that house. Yeah. It came with a mop and a bucket <laughs> for the basement <laughs> to God. take on the uh, water. At one come. point, one of the dads said, uh, Tom, can you, uh, can you take a look at the vents when you're there? Like, I, I you know, I, I'm thinking we should reach out to this landlord and get these vents clean. And I'm thinking there is just no way this landlord's clean. I look down these vents. There's like sticky stuff down there. It's just like dead fly stuck in whatever syrups down this drain. But you know what? The house gets treated similarly too, because they've had some pretty good parties from the videos I've seen in the house yeah. too. So, but yeah, to, to Tom's point, some of the ones that you deal with a little bit abnormal ones too because when i saw a pictures of someone like well no what kind of property is this because someone's like it's a student property like what do you mean it's a student property there's a quartz waterfall countertop (laughs) on the kitchen island i'm like what 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 kind of flipping student property's got that yeah yeah but those ones are getting extreme rents those are where you're seeing what 12 1300 bucks yes yes yeah yeah five bedrooms five and a half uh bath so every bedroom has its own ensuite yeah, those are uh, nice. furnished common areas. Tom's been looking for this. Did you find that? It looks like it. Um, Mike Moffat has a report and it says net new household size on average. And this is across Ontario. Like he's taking York, Durham, Halton, Simcoe, all the, you know, Toronto, 2.18. Hmm. Um, and he says, that, I, I don't know the distinction. Our net new household size, uh, 2.59. But then historically saying that looks like it's going to decline. So I'll have to look at it anywhere. It's somewhere. It looks yeah. like it's between those two numbers. Um, two and a quarter to but, two and a half. Somewhere in there. Yeah. 2.18. 2.59. Yeah. Yeah. It's somewhere there. Um, but on the uh, this whole single family home thing, I guess it just means that anyone, any anyone, a millennial generation, Z, what's the next one? Z, Z, Gen, Gen Z. They're basically not looking at single family homes as really a possibility. Like we're basically looking at younger generations who are either going to rent in this area, like other big cities, like New York, like LA, you like Paris. I don't and Rome. think so. Not in like a suburb. I, 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 I you think they'll still be able that. to buy. Yeah. I just look at the price to income and I'm like, cause I know somebody who's making their, you know, mid twenties in software industry, making a good income and the income they're earning to the price. Yeah, but they just got to They just got to figure it out. Like, I think that's the difference now. So like, is the path going to be as direct and as straightforward as it was before? Maybe. But that's what I mean. And that's what I'm talking about. Oh, like, yeah, but it was when I left school, pretty much all of us got a job. And if you were kind of semi decent at putting some money aside, side in short order. I mean, listen, when I left school, the income's going to be, you know, I'm in the 50 to $70,000 range pretty quickly. That wasn't my first salary, but pretty quickly. Four bedroom house, four bedroom madame, two car garage, 268,000. 
So when you're leaving school now, that same four bedroom, and that's what I'm talking about, that four, same four bedroom house in Mississauga is, you know, north of a million, the income. How much were your mortgage payment? Do you remember? Yeah, I feel like it was around 1500. Yeah, so the mortgage payment now if, on, on a, on a, it was a, it was a, it was a, four, it was a smaller four bedroom, right? How many square feet? Yeah, it was like 2,300 square so feet. 2,300 square feet. So that in, that in, you know, in around here, what's the price point there? So it's one, it's a million bucks? It's over. Yeah. 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 How, how much over? I think it's like 1.6, 1. 1.7, 1. 1.8 range, that house. Really? Mm -hmm. That's what those things are selling for? Well, yeah. Townhome why, in Burlington. Why'd you sell it? Why didn't you keep it? What's wrong with you? I know. I just kept moving. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, why didn't I just buy the whole street? I remember when I signed the piece of paper and I told the man in me a sales rep, somebody's got to buy at the top. It might as well be me. L true story. Carol was right there. I'm like, hey, someone's got to buy at the top because my, my friends bought, this is Steve and Sandy. They bought the, a similar house from Matt and me like 18 months earlier for 225. So on a percentage basis, when I'm signing at 268, I think I'm completely getting ripped off. Four bedroom, two car garage. And that's just what I mean. You're right. I guess if you move further and further out. But uh, yeah, I just, I, what I was saying is like, you just might have to have, there might be an intermediary step for people that are aggressive and want to get started early. They get a place, they rent out a unit, they live in it, or they rent out two units. That That's how they offset some of the costs. And then they eventually move into it. Yeah. Because we have investors that have done it. Like there's someone that's coming to mind now that, that did that. I remember him and his girlfriend, they were living in the basement and while renting upstairs. Uh, no different than, well, even Tim, I think, he, I don't know if he shared that, but when he was sharing his first thing he had a condo downtown he was rent while he was in school he was renting out the rooms there to do that type of stuff so i think it's like yeah you you know you yeah don't, but you what don't you're saying what you is that it's be. changed yeah yeah it's changed i just don't think it's not possible like i think it's like i think it's still very possible and something that people can aim towards and it's gonna it's harder and more work i don't know yeah but i think it's harder and more work i think flipping everything's harder and more work than it was yeah, yeah. Like, I think everything is harder and more work than it was five years ago than it was 10 years ago. You mm -hmm. know, I shouldn't say everything, like, you know, with computers and internet, but it's, I just mean like... Just the, like, when you were buying at 268, if you're going to put down 20%, you're basically putting down 50 grand. Yeah. More, 60 grand. Um, if, you're, if you're buying something for 1.8 million... <laughs> You're going to need like close to 400 grand. Yeah. No, I get it. The, the last few years of... And then that leaves you with a $1.6 million mortgage or whatever. No, yeah. less. 1.4. No, I get it. Like the last few years, like the last five years have really amplified things to a point that has got ridiculous. You know, but, you know, depending on what time frame, everyone that bought previously, like our, our parents looked at us what, and what you were buying your house for, my house for, and they're like, oh my God, I can't believe you're paying that much. I paid... Double, I played almost triple what our parents played mm -hmm. for a size, a house half the size when I bought. Our, no, know, I, I agree. Just the spread between income and house prices has just. Yes, gone I agree. Nuts. That I agree with. And, and I it just, was offset by low interest rates, so that'll depend on that and different mm -hmm. mortgage. And it's off the mortgage programs that you benefited from and I benefited from. They weren't around when our parents were buying homes. CMHC wasn't doing 5% down mortgages at that time. So that's one other thing that drove those prices up too, mm -hmm. because people were able to, more people could get into the market at that time. So yeah, it's totally skewed. I'm not saying it's not hundred percent. I think I just saying like for someone to come out and be like, you know what? I see that house there. I'm just not going to be able to do it. It's just not something I can even like think about or move towards. That's the what, what I'm trying to say mm -hmm. is like, I don't really agree with that. Yeah, I think it's possible. I guess I'm just concerned with the overall sentiment of the younger generation because they look around and when you look at income and asset prices, some are going to hustle and get through that. Absolutely. I just mean en masse, you're going to have a population base that's coming into formative years that are looking around thinking, hmm, this doesn't quite look right. And then what that breeds in society is what I don't like. Yeah. So I think it, there's like a weird trickle down effect to other things because of the way everything's structured. I mean, if you look at a lot of younger millennials, they're kind of pissed off at the way the world is. And it's like the whole pointing at the boomer for, you know, all the different problems that they perceive. I just think that continues a yeah, little bit. That, it, like part of that exists in every generation. Like every generation looks at the previous generation. That's that was Woodstock. You, you know what I mean? Like, isn't that like part of? I don't everything? know. Like I didn't. No, but that you're a person. You're, if you're making mm -hmm. like blanket statements based on what like this generation is based on some people you've spoken mm -hmm. to or media report or whatever. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like that it doesn't didn't that it's exist? Pretty common before? with millennials. We should get a millennial and we'll get Anthony over here. We'll talk about it. It's pretty common. But is the, is this the best of the worst? Like, where do we expect prices to be five, ten years from now? Like that's, can, yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's a fair point. Yeah, yeah, and that's the ultimate challenge. It's like, 
That's interesting that you say that because if prop property prices and assets just go higher from here because they kind of have to, the dollar has to debase further. It's programmatic. It's like a set deal. They just go higher. I'm interested. And the in the Gen Z kids, the kids of them, are going to be really pissed off. At well, and then there, but there is a wealth transfer. Boomers pass, older generation passes away. There's some wealth that's passed down. So like you kind of maybe kind of sort of can keep this whole thing rolling. Um, but Mike, I'm curious then, like for investor sentiment to you, what are you seeing from investors who are looking at real estate? I think for the investors that have been with us for a while, um, the ones that you know were lucky enough. To, to ride that gravy train. Rates were low, appreciation was going nuts. Yeah, 20 times, nobody had to be too brilliant, yeah, let's face it. Nice, close your eyes, throw a dart on yeah, the board. Yeah, yeah. That's where you're gonna buy. Um, you, could, you could do no wrong back then. But uh, yeah, cash flow, appreciation, um, the rise in rents that we had. Um, it's harder for them right now to get into this market just because that's not the norm right now. So I think the sentiment with the, the investors that are now executing are, are, are investors that they, they, they didn't have any properties in a portfolio and they see this as a good time right now. Yeah, so you're seeing that like you have an example. Yeah, I would say the, the, the people that are buying now are new people, like mm -hmm. people that unfortunately like, um, you didn't know, you where, just get one, somebody kind of two right? surgeons. Okay. Yeah. yeah okay, so what's, everything what's in, the story there? Yeah. Done everything right in, right in life, you know, making decent incomes, you know, you have certain wealth advisors that are working on your behalf when you're making that type of income, but they feel they're not getting ahead. Because I'll tell you, I've sat down with people who've invested with financial advisors and I've sat down with financial advisors here. And I'll tell you, w one of them owns multiple homes, maybe, you know, the financial one up advisor the does? cottage, one in Florida, maybe has a couple boats and it's not the investor. It's always the, the financial, financial advisor. advisor. <laughs> yeah. One person's making money in, in that scenario there. Oh my God. But uh, so yeah, a lot of people are realizing their investments, uh, stocks, uh, financial advisors are not performing as well as- And is that what these thought. two surgeons mentioned? Correct, yeah. So it's like, hey, we need help. Help us. Let's get some- Why? Because they had been doing the stock thing and they just felt like they weren't getting ahead. Correct, yes. I but, swear mutual, oh sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, just at that caliber, we're talking about people that you know don't feel like they're getting Income ahead is here. strong. Yeah, it's like, how is that possible? Like, we, we well, I just, you know what? Uh, while you guys were speaking, I went uh, and took the S&P 500 for 20 years. So let's see these, this couple invested for 20 full years, did everything right. And I took the S&P 500 and I divided by USM2. I mean, you know, I know we're in Canada, but USM2 um, is the, just the amount of currency in the system. And if you look at that for 20 years, the S&P 500 returns against the debasement of the currency, your purchasing power is only up 20% over a 20 year investment horizon. You're up 20% total. 1% a year? But that that's, means you're up, yeah. you've outpaced them too. You've at least maintained your purchasing yeah. power, but you're, 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 you've made 20% gain. So for anyone listening- And that's the, assuming that you stayed in for that entire, entire time. time. And people. there's no other fees that yeah. you're paying anyone else that would Actually, chew into one, that 20%. One, one, yeah, so once you do the fees, then- that's Once stopped. a year, probably nothing. I mean, I look at my, if I look at my mother-in-law's, some of her financial statements at CIBC with Gundy, they just never change. The, they like the balance just stays the same for multiple yeah. decades. The, look, mutual funds to me are the seventh wonder of the world for exactly that reason. It, because I'll never forget when I left the region of Peel, I had I think it was I want to say it was about fifteen or twelve or fifteen grand in what the, whatever the government retirement fund thing is, and I could take it privately at that time. I could leave it in that, that or I had to put it in a lira. So I transferred it, and at that time I was like, oh, you know, I'll put it in these emerging market funds because I thought like, well, those are like high growth potentially, whatever. So I l left it in there, and all these things went up. Like, I, you know, I was reading about that growth of China and India and all this stuff. And I go, oh, these funds should be pr pretty good. I went back and I'm like, I'm up. And this was after like probably like 10 years. I was up like 6% or maybe I was down. So like, I was like, what, what, like, what are you talking about? How is this even possible? So yeah, those things to me, I'm just like, I don't. I, I think once we finally realized the measuring stick we're all using to measure our wealth is the dollar. And if M2, which is all of the money supply that exists in Canada, is being debased at a rate of 8.5% from 1969 to the current day, then the measuring stick that we are using to measure our wealth is broken. Yeah. So we're all going around trying to measure how well we're doing income-wise or investment-wise, but the measuring stick is broken. So you can no longer use the Canadian dollar to reflect how you're getting ahead, whether it's your income or your net worth. No, you just gotta look at how, it's almost like, we talked about this before, you, you, beside every balance, it's almost like you need a basket of goods, and that's how much you know what, how well you've done. Because if you put $10,000 in and that can buy, 
whatever a whole cow will use will use beef you know and and then when you when you see your your investment pay so that's got a picture beside of a whole cow beside the the ten thousand dollars in your bank account and then 10 years from now that's the picture of three steaks then you're like, oh, I didn't do so good. But then if 10 years or from now- five hot dogs. Yeah. But then 10 years from now, you have the picture of the same, the same investment and you have a picture of two cows. You're like, oh man, actually I'm doing pretty good. Yeah. Like it's, it's almost like you need- Another that. measuring stick to yeah. measure things. Because you don't know what the, because you can't and keep up on what, what things cost anymore. So you don't know what the dollars buy. And it's why real estate investors have done fairly well is because real estate is more scarce than dollars. Dollars are being created at an, a rate of 8.5% across the economy a year. That's how much M2 is growing. And the doll, the real estate's more scarce. And then if you layer in leverage on the real estate, you put 20% down, average appreciation on real estate. Let's let's just give it like 7% since 1969 to the current day. Tor- the Toronto Real Estate Board average. Toronto, Re- okay, so I'm uh, sorry, thank you. Toronto Real Estate Board, 7%, that's a 35% return. It's 35% return is greater than 8.5. It's why real estate investors get ahead. And, do, but, and there's work involved. Work so, involved, right. tenants to manage, landlord, tenant yeah. board, there's all these things, but where else do you outpay? So like, to, you have to deal with all these hassles but what else are you left to do? Yeah. And then the investor is vilified for going into real estate by the, their own government, by the media. But the system itself is pushing people into real estate. It's the only way to grow your purchasing power. Like if you go to the bank and open a savings account, you were talking about this the other day, that the rate is like 1% or whatever. I was blown away. That t- uh, I'll just say it was the Tangerine savings account, one of the ones I had to, you know, put, I had some money there. I have this automatic withdrawal and then when it gets a certain amount, then I take that money and do something else with it. And I thought, in, in, and I got an email that said, hey, you're, you, here's a special offer. And I think it was 4.25% I think that was the special offer for if I, any new deposits for six months or whatever it was. And um, I'm like, oh, 4.25, I'm like, you know, for a bank account, that's actually, you know, that's not that bad. Um, but I wonder, what's the, what's the rate they're paying? It was 0.7%. I'm like, what the heck? I go, rates have gone up a bunch. I go, I thought it'd be better. I wasn't expecting like anything, you know, too crazy, but less than, less than 1% still, even in today's environment. I'm like, wow, that mm. seems kind of interesting to me, right? So I was surprised by it. Yeah, it was super low. And, I've no, and that's a tangerine. Well, I mean, those ones are typically higher. If you're with one of the big five banks, you're probably lower than that. And it's going to be interesting to see what happens, I guess, Mike, back to your point on real estate. And like, are we at the best time now? Mm-hmm. Because the Fed, now the market is pricing in a Fed cut for every meeting next year, starting in March. And I'm assuming that's not going to happen. Oh, that's I think a lot, but that's what the, that market, that, that changes like almost every week based on a CPI. Yeah. But that's what, that's what the market is pricing in right now as we're recording this in early January. That markets are now pricing in a rate cut of every Fed meeting this year beginning in March until December of 2024. Effectively, markets are saying the interest rates will move in a straight line lower. And I, I'm assuming that's not going to exactly be the case. But if next year, if rates, if we are, if the U.S. is hitting a recession... The U.S. Think about this. If the U.S. is hitting a recession, the U.S. is currently sitting at a 6% deficit, roughly, you know, kind of rounding there. The U.S. has never gone into a recession before with a 6% deficit. And Luke Roman does a good job of this, of talking about what's his number. His number is that like at every recession um, have, have coincided with an increase in deficits of 6 to 12%. If they're already at 6%, and the deficit increases because it's a recession by six to 12%, that means they, they're, you know, we're at like 14, 15, 16% US deficit. The money printing that needs to be required to meet that deficit is astronomical. Mm-hmm. And then the interest payments costs on that and the amount of M2 that's gonna grow and the debasement of the dollar. So what happens to the price of groceries and real estate in that world? Well, and that- Canada always does better than the US at debasing its currency because we need to maintain our dollar as a cheaper level against the US dollar because we're an export-based economy. That means our debasement is gonna likely be, if history is a guide, even stronger. What the heck happens to property prices and everything else here, rent, food? Yeah, drop rates in an environment where we have builders the I'll go earlier than that. Architects not even designing the properties <laughs> to be built. Drop rates yeah. in that environment. So no we, supply coming. It's going to take a while to get supply up. But that's right? the single. That's the single family. Correct. But correct, even but yeah. even on the condos. Yeah. They've pulled back a lot of the projects. Yeah. Yeah. A, a lot. Like so. So I know the ones that were launched before are closing yeah. now. Right. But I'm saying like in a couple of years time, once that that what's been in the pipeline kind of works its way through. Yeah. There's not a lot more coming on the market. I did. Right. I did. Sorry. I did look up that 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 number. Um, in Ontario, so according to Statista, they say the average number of people um, in Ontario per household is 
in Canada was 2.51. But in Ontario specifically, they're saying 2.9. You're going to have to tell Mike Moffat. So, Sorry. Well, I'll tell, I mean, I, just, I gave you the source. He can figure it out. <laughs> He's a smart guy. I've seen the trucks he makes. They're great. So he can figure that stuff out. No problem. I feel like since 2008, when quantitative easing kind of solved the financial crisis, um, the, uh, the whole we're on a zombie eco- economy at this point. Like nothing's making sense anymore. Incomes are not matching anything to do with assets anymore. I know we're talking about still possible, do some house hacking and get into the market. I just feel like everything's gone completely out of whack. And I think it's because the way the economy is structured, like we need population growth, we need cap debt growth, we need money, and we need productivity growth. And kind of those three things make up GDP. And the population growth is really, all the Western countries are trying to do it through weird immigration policies where you're just stuffing people in. Christia Freeland just said it the other day that Western countries are suffering from popular. Did you hear that clip? Oh my God. I know it was brutal. I, I can, know. I can, it was absolutely like brutal. Five seconds in. I know you like, can't even I listen. Won't, I won't you listen. can't even I, listen. I wish on Twitter you could uh, speed up when you know when uh, like on audible you could mm-hmm. speed up the pace of that uh, oh you can of the video yeah can you, can. you on twitter yeah oh, okay because it's brutal it's, it's like so it's, brutal. it's like a default half pace with her or trudeau talking but it if goes so slow yeah and if there's somebody that's saying something where you're thinking like i don't think they're telling the full truth it's them just like like the just look the on their way face. they're talking yeah. about well, she can't it's like she's they're searching but like, she might be actually right that canada could benefit from population growth but to think about it without second order effects of housing healthcare, transportation like it's so ridiculous. Which I think was the question. Was right? the question. Yeah. She yeah. didn't answer anything. Yeah. Exactly. I feel like the twitching. <laughs> normal. I feel like the, the twitching she does is like that's her tell. So like if yeah. she was a poker player, she'd be right. twitching at the table. All, all, <laughs> oh all my God. So that's why because I feel like everything she says is a lie. So I'm like, yeah. oh, now I get it. That's why she's got those weird faces and she's always right. shaking. Her <laughs> <stuff>. <laughs> but the other co- component yeah. of yeah. GDP growth is if population needs to grow and debt or capital, we use debt based system. So debt needs to grow. They need the debt to grow. Like they need it to grow. You can only play games with higher rates for so long. Otherwise, there's not enough new money or debt receipts or whatever you want to call this money in the system to pay for the interest and the old debt. So you always need more and more. And if we're in a world where like housing is slowing down, housing is a big factor in all this because it creates a lot of new M2. When you and I sign a mortgage, we're creating a lot of new M2. When we refinance a home, a lot of new M2. That's why they're going after that property tax they implemented uh, yesterday. Was it yesterday? Yeah. Ten and a half percent. Oh, what, so it, what is it? it? Toronto? Toronto, yeah. Yeah, 10%, no? 10 and a half. 10 and a half. 10 and a half, 10 and a half. Yeah. 10 and a half percent. With potentially 16 if they don't get something like another $250 million from the federal and government. And Calgary just increased their property yeah. tax. They got to get money somehow. But the, yeah. prob- the problem in all this, so yeah, like I agree with everything you're saying, but this, this, where I get frustrated with this is it's it's a load of bullshit because all this comes back to is a shitty spending by the government. They take in money mm-hmm. and they waste it. They give it to they give it to whoever the hell they want. You know, they do all these stupid programs. I saw them firsthand when I was working at the government and there's so much waste that happens there that it trickles down to everything else. But how about instead of do paying for these stupid studies on ridiculous things all these times and worrying about stuff that really doesn't matter to people, why don't we take some of that money and start start investing it in our own in, infrastructure into our infrastructure into our economy like it's just starting, it doesn't make sense to anymore. Use logic there no but it's just it's so yeah because it's so blindly obvious at this point like now we've gone to this point it's so blindly mm-hmm. obvious that it's like what the hell are we doing but like what so some people are i guess are what not going to be offended or some people that are getting handouts now are going to get handouts i get it like it sucks it sucks and it sucks for everyone and maybe we've all have times that we suck i don't know what it is but i i feel very strongly that if you go through this budget properly like you know as, as with with a realistic outlook that you could shave off enough money to start at least slowly taking some money and putting it into infrastructure and industries in Canada that work, that can support our economy and grow our economy and give everyone opportunity and jobs. And it's just, it, it blows my mind. But instead, they're just worried about the way they look, like, you know, just this, this you know, virtue signaling for a variety of different things. And, 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 you know, and every time something comes up, like with Trudeau, like, you know, there was the We Charity scandal, like there's always this money that the uh, LNC Lavalin, the, you know, there's this money disappearing here. I'm like, this is crazy. And, and we're just it's a snapshot compared to how how bad it is in the states too but it's just you it, not a snapshot we're, we're a lot smaller than what it's like in the states but it's it's the same problem everywhere and that's where i guess i just get frustrated i'm like i feel like saying yeah screw this all mm-hmm. <laughs> right but then i'm like where do you go what do you do yeah yeah I, the, the thing that kind of i think the day that i was driving up to collingwood this struck me um because there's this press release that, just to your point, Nick, about government spending, the Philippines receives climate finance commitment from Canada. And I can't find the amount. The, the press release I saw, I thought it said $200 million. 
And at the same time that I was getting that information that day, I drove by a billboard on the way up to Collingwood saying, we're doing a fundraiser because the Collingwood hospital doesn't have an MRI machine. And I'm like, well, wait a second, we're committing 200 million. And again, I haven't verified that number. I'm trying to Google it up right now um, to the Philippines on climate change. But we have a hospital that doesn't have an MRI machine. Like, how much does an MRI machine cost? Yeah, like, no I, idea, I don't even under, understand why I'm calling sure it's less than two hundred million. But even even that, let's not let's not buy the MRI machine. Let's hold off on the MRI machine. Let's use the two hundred million to invest in something that's going to generate income, so that we can re- get a return on the two hundred million and buy the MRI machine. Like, how about that? You like, how about we just use some thought? It doesn't know? make any sense. I didn't even understand what's happening. No offense to Collingwood. Yeah. They need an MRI machine. No, I want like, to get it there sooner else, than You know later. what else I don't understand what example. we don't do is when we increase our population, like through the whole pandemic thing, I was reaching out to the provincial MP saying, hey, I'm just kind of curious. Like I wasn't even trying to stir the pot. I thought I was asking something pretty basic. I'm like, I'm just interested. How many beds per capita do, does Oakville, hospital beds, does Oakville have or Halton region or whatever, however you want to count it. Like, and how is that trending? I couldn't get an answer from the provincial government. They wouldn't give me the answer. And I don't know where to find that answer. Maybe it's obvious and someone can share that with us. Because I'm just curious, like there's probably a lot of private organizations like Rockstar out there that if we need to raise money to get more beds for the population, I think a lot of us will raise money. We'll do our best to fundraise and raise money. But we don't even know how many new beds we have historically in these different areas. And is it matching the population growth? Like, I would just like to know how many hospital beds we have per capita, maybe in the province and by region. And I guess it's out there, but I just couldn't find it. Well, shame on you. Why is it so- shame on you for asking? Yeah, like it was just kind of ridiculous. I don't they probably. You know why? They don't probably know. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> how don't we know? Why. I just don't understand how we don't know this basic thing. That's, isn't that just ridiculous? So, like, what is going on now? You got me thinking. Like, what's going on in healthcare? What's going on in education? What's going on with infrastructure, transportation? What's going on? I don't understand. <laughs> Anyway, sorry. But when we go back... There's something to be said is why when you go outside of the city a little bit further and you see people that are like, you know, in smaller towns and you, they're at the farmer's market maybe and like a lot more people are living off the land or they know like, oh, I know Mike. Mike's uh, my, where I get, you know, th- this and this from and Tom's where I get this and this from and everyone's got their own network and community and they all support one another and stuff and people have to make decisions based on what they have and they have to think about it and they, they need to either plant crops or raise animals and there's like a, there's a delay, there's not this instant gratification. It's, it's like it changes the way of thinking that way. But it's it's like when you get a bunch of humans in this city that all get together and, and they just start if, chirping at each other. Yeah, and it's not I don't think it's like made we're not really made to live in that type of environment and then some people it, because there's just not enough for it to go around for everyone and there's there's no way people aren't independent like you know self-sufficient I should say so they can't support one another and help you other people that way so then then you get people that are falling off and then then you know they look to the government for help and I'm not saying that I I'm all for helping people like I I think we should but the way it's done is so inefficient and so corrupt and it's just so frustrating. bad. Mm-hmm. Like it's it's just it's it's nothing frustrates me more. Could, so hey, I looked it up. It's anywhere from five. It looks like five hundred grand. Tesla's got an MRI machine for three million, but from, anywhere from about five hundred to a million for an MRI, like a decent MRI machine. So you could instead of giving them two hundred, they could have given them one ninety nine. And <laughs> you know, what I mean? Mike, what are you seeing on real estate? Like, what investors are you? you were talking, uh, and I don't remember all the details. Was there a property you were working with that you were turning into duplex and adding a third unit? No, somewhere it was a single family home. Yeah, can you share that? Three. Just is that what that investor is doing? Just as a that way, Tom and I. Will calm down and we won't be so yeah, soft yeah. by the time you're done no so that one's in uh, St. Catherine St. Catherine's had a square foot limit at the time when we purchased of 645 square feet on the accessory unit so you cannot exceed that um, but this one we actually wanted to add two two accessory units so we had to apply for a minor variance because both of those accessory units would exceed the 645 they're closer to a little over a thousand square feet the variance got approved so we have this one house that we're turning into a very comfortable three unit home um, but all these cities are changing right now with, uh, in regards to the requirements for these accessory units, Niagara Falls just switched where, um, they had one of the most stringent, stringent, uh, rules in regards to accessory dwellings. And that was, you could not exceed. So the accessory unit could not exceed 40% of the square footage of the main floor. Owner also had to live in one of those units. So you can only do two units on a single family home. So they went from that to owner does not have to live in any of the units. 
Um, there is no limit on the square foot size and you can change that one single family home into three units. Obviously the home, if you are gonna do it into a three unit home, you wanna make sure that it has the size to accommodate the three units. Um, that might be a little compact if it's like a 900 square foot bungalow. Because now you're down to you sure to the but we're gonna see. I I know in Kitchener yeah. people are doing those bungalows where they're making a legal second yeah. suite and dropping a garden suite now if the lot is big so, enough. So that yeah yeah sorry right. go ahead sorry yeah 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 so you got Kitchener like that you got Hamilton where you can actually take single family home add two more units if the lot size accommodates you can add a, a garden suite as well now so you're turning one property into four streams of income now with four different units. That um, example in St. Catharines, what was that property purchased for and what will the three units rent it's out It's a for? massive house. It was an original bungalow. And then back in the day, and we the, the amount of work that myself and the architect had to do with the city in order to get this passed, this went on for months and we kept getting extensions on the deal because as we're going through that, we didn't want the owner to incur those costs, those carrying costs. So we kept getting extensions on our conditions when we were buying the home. And I was fully disclosing to the the realtors, what we were trying to do. It was a very, very unique home because it was so massive. Um, we, I went to the extent of, we went down, myself and the architect, who was a former city inspector for the city of Niagara Falls of 30 years, we go down to the city of St. Catharines and uh, they had this uh, hardcover book that they produce every single year and it is the names and the phone numbers of the residents of homes. So our case was this home is so massive. It already has a second kitchen, uh, second laundry facility, a separate AC and furnace. There's a whole two story addition built oh, wow. to this house. Okay. Our, our case was, listen, this is not a single family home. This is a two unit home. Geo warehouse that I use, we use, um, it said semi. Hmm. The city of St. Catharines couldn't pull up the plans of how this second edition was ever approved. So we get this hardcover book and the, the, case, the, the case they said to us is, if you can prove that this was used by two families, I forget the date that they wanted us to go back to, then we'll um, potentially grant you uh, the permit to, to build these three units. So we get this, this book, we're going through it on the counter and uh, sure enough, that address, two different names, two different phone numbers. So that was one case. Nice. So like, okay, well that's pretty good. I'm like, what else do you need? We need a bit more proof. So I'm like, okay, let me go back to the history of the listing. So on the listing, when these, the, the owners that we bought off of like eight, nine years prior on the listing, it says occupant, occupant type. Usually it's owner or tenant. This particular listing, when th these owners who were purchasing bought eight, 10 years ago, it said owner plus tenant. So oh. then I brought that in. Okay. Now it's slam dunk. Trying to get a hold of the agent who did that deal eight, 10 years ago. I find out that he's moved to the Costa Rica. Okay. Like, I can't find him anywhere. I'm, I see him on Instagram though. So I'm like, Hey, eight, 10 years ago, you sold this house. Um, I, I needed him to step up too. Anyways, we pr produce all that to the city. They're like, not good enough. We got to go to. We like, need more housing. Have, yeah, 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 absolutely. It had two separate driveways. Like, anyways, long story short, we went to apply for the minor variance. It did get approved, uh, without a shadow of a doubt. It was never an issue, but we had to jump through a lot of hoops to get it. Wow. Approved. Okay. And then, so what's the yeah. what was the purchase for? What's the rent yes, roughly going to be? You did ask me that. Purchase was low nines. The conversion is going to be about uh, eighty grand uh, to make it legal. Uh, rents were we are, we're on market right now. And again, like I said, January 6th and 7th is when showings really picked up for a lot of listings. Uh, we have somebody here that's showing that property to like eight to 10 different couples uh, this weekend. What's your expected gross Sorry, rent? Sorry, yeah, yeah. So 2,300 on one unit, 24 on another, and then the last one probably about 18. So what are we at? 40? 87. So It's like six and a half roughly or something like that. So 24. Uh, yeah, so, what sorry. 20, 75. Eight, eight, it's going to be like 7,500. Yeah, yeah. I lost track of the numbers. Yeah, 23, 24, and about 18. We're all slow. That's 23, okay. 24. Yeah, I'm, yeah. Why am I drawing? Six, seven, yeah, 75, Five, no? Six. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> oh, slow. Yeah, I was yeah. like, I was a 65. Behind 65. Is it 65? 65? Yeah. That's, yeah. Like, that's what I was fighting with, yeah. one yeah. or the other. Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, oh yeah, forty. Yeah, added a thousand. Yeah, guys, we yeah. can sixty-five. We're good. We'll help you. With oh that. yeah, we we know our numbers. Don't we're, worry. We're when it comes to real estate, we can break down the numbers. Don't <laughs> worry. We, we got, got it under control. We got addition down pat. Yeah. <laughs> oh my That's gosh, the easy how part. How slow is that yeah. math? Filling's the easy part. Oh yeah, it's, it's getting these uh, legal through <laughs> the the city. That's that. But the, dude, the, that's the, a, that's. <laughs> Yeah, that's a crazy story. Yeah, oh my. what you had to go through so for much one. more. And, yeah. the, um, and then I'm curious on yeah. McMaster. Yeah. We were talking about student rentals. Just for the demand, the demand still there on student rentals for uh, McMaster, for Guelph, for Western. Okay, yes. so yeah. investors buying properties in those areas, they're renting yeah. them out quickly. Yeah, they're paying about. Uh, say McMaster, if you're going in a premium area, we're going to call it's Westdale. You're looking at about uh, 850 to 1.1 for a purchase price. And then rooms, you're ranging anywhere between 800 to 1,000 a room. And, and uh, the nice thing about McMaster and Hamilton right now is outside of that pilot project, those rooms are sort of, it's a free for all. Like you could have six rooms, nine rooms, yeah. like unlike yeah, London, there's a lot of, yeah. Yeah. London legal limit five. Um, different cities, different. Okay. So then in 2024, let's just talk about the trend of student rental housing. Where do you mm. see the trend of rents in student rental housing, de rents and demand? The trend yeah. stays as it is up or down? Yeah, I think that, and I think this applies to the single family rentals as well. And I'm going to exclude condos for, for, okay. for a moment because I don't, I don't think that, that those are comparable. I, th I, I think we've reached the peak for a while now. I think we're going to so sort of balance out now. Which yeah, just it's seems pre like they're pretty hot. They've come in hot. Mm -hmm. It's such a significant jump in such a short amount of time. So I think I think we're going to be more balanced with the student rentals uh, rents right now. Um, outside of the properties that uh, you, you were talking about, Nick, with somebody's in there for three years, once that those students uh, roll over, we're going to be back up to market. Um, Human nature is interesting on that point, Mike, yeah. because do you remember it was only four years ago during the pandemic that everyone had convinced themselves no one's going to school anymore mm -hmm. and student rentals were going to nosedive yeah. into people the ground. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. People were, some people totally, were yeah. panicking to sell student right. rentals yeah, before yeah. it was quote unquote yeah. too late. Yeah. We filled, we had to fill two of our properties during that year. Yeah. We filled them both. We filled them both. Yeah. And this year, I know yeah. you already talked about that. We changed yeah. the rent on, on one of them. Yeah. So I think uh, the single family homes as well, these second suites, I think we've topped on those rents as well. They might've even come down a tiny bit, but again, we're not in a market right now where people are going gang gangbusters for rentals. Like December, January is typically a slower month. And then the condo market, I think it, it goes back to a lot of those buyers that have bought that unfortunately with the intent to sell that are now holding on, waiting for a better time, who've opted now to lease out their units, there's just a big supply for the meantime. Like right now, this moment, this snapshot in time where people got to compete on price because that's how those units work. So a couple of these uh, listings, they're chipping away, coming down on their their list price to, in order to minimize the carrying costs. And then what do you think demand is for uh, rental units from tenants in 2024? Like how long is it, are we kind of in a balance? Yeah. I think it's going to come in a little strong, not like we saw during the COVID era, but uh, I think just a lot of people's disposable income has been exhausted, mm. like with the, the cost uh, to just survive nowadays. So I think um, there's going to, it, it's, there's going to be more renters in the market um, just because people can't qualify. And with the immigration that's coming in that I think, I think the rental market's going to continue to be strong. Mm -hmm. So we're back to, if someone has a vacant rental unit, how many weeks will it take them to fill? Yeah. So I, th I think it's fair to say six to eight weeks, you should be done. Mm -hmm. And that, that involves Which getting is our historical yeah. average, you would say, no? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. But we were at a time where rentals were like six to eight hours they were being <laughs> filled, multiple offers. But uh, I think a key point too is um, you got to use Rentify and Verifast when you're running a profile on a tenant. And I'll tell you why, because I mentioned earlier about those three offers that we got. Mm -hmm. Well, one of those offers had three pay stubs, not three pay stubs, three pay receipts. So the woman was uh, invoicing the company. She was working with a realtor. I, I, I received everything, driver's license, Equifax report, these three um, uh, rent, re, uh, sorry, pay, pay receipts. receipts. And uh, it's just something about those pay receipts wasn't resonating with me well. And I'm like, I said, okay, you know what? Can you do me a huge favor? Can you send me the last bank statements that shows these last three receipts, these deposits? I want to see these deposits into the bank account. Agent says, yeah, no problem. I'll get them to you. Ghost at me for two days. I didn't get that. So... Verifast, what Verifast does. So Rentify will give you the credit report. Verifast looks into the bank account. So you can see from what business those payments are coming in from. 
There's also a section where you can see if the person has paid, um, uh, has bought anything from a pet store. Mm-hmm. I can't believe that's opened <laughs> up. Like, I can, just cannot believe yeah, that. Yeah. Um, the average balance that they keep in their account, what's in their account. Like it's, 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 it's the most in depth into somebody's financial, uh, and history so that I've ever saw seen. that there was not, no, we didn't get that far. For oh, that okay, one. Got it. Yeah. We're doing that with tenants. I, no, she ghosted. I, I couldn't get any more information. And obviously they weren't chosen for the unit, but I think there's going to be a little more sort of, it's so easy to fraudulently, mm-hmm. unfortunately, submit stuff like that nowadays, fake NOAs. So you really got to do your homework. And, and I th- again, I think it goes back to the, you know, checking with the, the previous landlord. I was talking to somebody about this the other day. I'm like, have you, has a landlord ever given somebody a bad reference? Cause I've never gotten that. And being on the other side too, like if you want somebody out of your house, <laughs> Unfortunately, like, let's be honest here. Are you going to give that person a you bad You got to go two landlords back almost. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. 100%. You'd well, be surprised I, though. Some people would be like, oh, well, you know, because you know, there's those people that like the glass isn't always happy, half full. So yeah. they'll be like, oh yeah, they were good. But you know, like there was this and this and this and they just keep they're current in your house and you want them out. Yeah. Oh, if you want them <laughs> yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Landlord calls, hey, you want that guy out? You mean the in your head, the one that hasn't been paying me for six months and... <laughs> No, you know what? They're horrible. I'll keep them. <laughs> don't worry, man. I'll, you know, they're great. They haven't this. paid me in six months. Yeah. You know, but I don't um, think those people are looking to their hand out that reference. They're just, <laughs> well, they're, first, they're not even doing that, but they're not even looking to move. They're just waiting to wait, yeah. wait it out yeah. before they get into panic yeah. situation. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. And, and then investor, dem- I'm just curious, investor demand. Cause a lot of people are say sky is falling in the real yeah. estate land. Are you seeing a lot of like people say, Oh my gosh, Mike, I blood in the streets. Get me yeah. out of this property. Drop the price to whatever I need to do. I need to sell a property. No. And I, I had not a call like that, but a call where the investor said, Hey, you know, I, I'm thinking about selling these two properties and I got into why. Was that their whole portfolio? It was. Yeah. Okay. And they're actually renting themselves. They're okay. renting themselves, have these two investment properties. And I'm like, why? And then when we got down to that, why it was because of a side business that they were doing that they were only able to do because of the rental properties on the multiple refinances that they'd done with those properties. And I said, you know what, maybe instead of looking at selling the rentals, we should look at this side business because the rentals have been supporting this business the mm-hmm. whole time. Like when we got down to the nitty gritty and the numbers. And how'd they take that? Very well, like incredibly well. Like we are not selling. Hmm. We got to get this business in order. So they were trying to sell the golden goose. Exactly. Yeah. So going back to um, investors, get me out of this. No, um, that's not on the buy side. I think everybody, like all of us, were trying to figure out where is this going? Like how many more rate increases are we going to have to endure here? Um, but now I feel like people are coming off the fence mm-hmm. and, 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 and getting out there to look and wanting to pull the trigger. So if we do get some rate drops this year with the lack of supply, with the population growth, you're thinking there'll be strong, like a price floor, like some support here in prices at this point. If you had to guess, I know no one's going for an increase, just supply yeah, and demand. Yeah. yeah. Like this could make 2021 yeah. look like nothing. I and think, hopefully that. Oh, really? Well, yeah. It's when will we know? Yeah. Mid February? No, I have to. I, I don't think there could be enough rate cuts. By mm, that time, God, to, good point. That's cause, fair because yeah. mid February we kind of get a sense of the spring market, but yeah. we don't have any rate cuts, so it's going to take longer. Because even but if, we don't need the rate cuts because rates are down, right? Fixed yeah. rates are fixed already are down. Big, yeah. Fixed, yeah. Fixed, then they're yeah. down big. Okay, so you're thinking yeah. by mid February. Well, some we of them know. are in the fours, high mm-hmm. fours. I mean, they might have just popped over five again. You know, this week I, I don't know, but but I mean, they're, so basically in four weeks you're five. thinking we'll have a clue into the spring market. Well, you're gonna, we're, we're already seeing it. Like, I, I think we saw the floor, like we've our, our prices have already been grinding sideways. Now, if you're depending on the pocket and the exact. Yeah, there's always going to be an example of the house bought up, at the top down, and sold. Whatever. Yeah, yeah, you know I agree. I mean? But they, we've already been grinding sideways. Mm-hmm. So I don't think, I think the kind of, you know, and with the, with potential changes, so fixed rates are down if, if there are interest rates cuts. I, I think the floor's kind of in. That's going to upset a lot of real estate term. bears. A lot of real estate bears want the. Uh, I, look, I'm, I'm going to be wrong, but uh, look. Yeah, I, I guess if, if something happens in the geopolitics and the rates, you know, inflation everything. goes crazy and rates have to go up from here, it changes absolutely everything. Yeah. Well, or yeah, mm, yeah exactly. Because yeah. because oil, like, I mean, look, the mm. U.S. just started bombing. Yeah, they're in, in Yemen. Yemen there's cruise so like, missiles yeah, landing. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so there's like, you know, yeah. the oil skyrockets. Mm. So yeah, anything can change. But I mean, all things being equal right now with the current 
situation where the where it looks right now i don't know i i find that hard to hard to believe do i think that they're going to start i, I don't necessarily agree with mike that like 2020 it might be like a 2021 mm. situation but i i don't think uh and i guess maybe that's my bias like i don't want it to be i know that was it oh yeah no that was insane those, those are like yeah. unhealthy markets yeah. but i think that we can grind sideways and get some stability underneath it and maybe we, we go back to something you know some kind of normal traditional BS monetary system inflation based increases not yeah. because real estate's the be all and end all and it just goes up it's just because of the way our system works things go up in in you know on the, the the price tag of things go up but the value ends up remaining the same so I guess going forward in 2024 from here on out the quality of your future life is going to be highly correlated to the quality of the assets that you earn or own the quality of your financial life will be directly in proportion to the quality of the financial assets that you own. I think because that, if it's dollars that you own, income denominated in dollar, dollars, you're going to struggle. Yeah. I don't think that's changed. I think that's always been the same. I think it's just become more important now. Mm -hmm. Right. But that's always been the case. Like, like it, with the benefit of hindsight now, you know, if I go back 20 years ago and looked at what I was doing 20 years ago, you know, Knowing that, I probably would have focused on. I mean, I was fortunate; I was already focusing on on real estate, so that was good. But I would have focused on some other things as well that would have benefited me a little bit bigger, mm -hmm. a little bit. Better. I just think it's it's being spread through the population a little bit. Like Mike's example of the two surgeons reaching out for real estate. Yeah, I'm not sure. sure that was there. I don't think they were thinking real estate. You know, yeah. so I guess maybe just everyone in their career, you kind of have to go through ten or twenty years of investing in the stock market to realize that's not going to get you ahead. It, so in 2024, you use assets plural. What do you believe are quality assets oh, for 2024? I'm leaving here. Yeah. <laughs> See you, bye. It's so simple to me. It's just real estate and Bitcoin. It's like the perfect mix together. Real estate is the best. It, look, the value of real estate is because of the scarcity of it and the leverage that you gain in the fiat world. Like It's pretty, pretty straightforward. And most wealthy people I've ever looked at in life, doesn't matter what their background was, how they made their money, end up having some real estate. Okay, so I, I want uh, yeah. GICs. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. So real, high yield real estate, and then, and then I got with, some NFTs and some weed stuff. Yeah, yeah, perfect, perfect. Yeah. perfect. That, yeah. That's what I'm looking for. Now. Yeah. So yeah. real estate fiat yeah. world, Bitcoin, the new digital. Okay. World. So the reality is though that a lot of people out there do not have savings, so they're not mm -hmm. sitting on fifty, a hundred, hundred fifty thousand in cash. Real estate comes in. Okay, that's what I was going to ask. Yeah, you, you kind of have to like. Like, okay, and it's kind of like, estate, unfortunately, but real yeah. estate is a great, it propels you in the fiat world through the leverage mm -hmm. that if you can do the right things, you have to be smart, you have to maintain your properties, you have to deal with tenants, but it propels your fiat financial world forward faster that you could then take some of that and create some longer term savings to put into Bitcoin. Unless you're coming to the table today with some savings, then you might want to look at Bitcoin as a store of value. Well, there's difference. It goes back to the three bucket thing. There's mm -hmm. in, there's the savings and there's like an income component. So I think they're yeah. they're kind of two different things. Although maybe you know one day in the future there's a, a well over time I, I would think that Bitcoin's going to take some of the monetization value of real estate out of the market. I mean, real estate, especially residential real estate, has benefited from becoming monetized. And it's basically the savings account of everybody, mm -hmm. right? And you never know. There's potential that you can leverage against it, too, if, you know, at a certain level, like no different than people can leverage against certain stock portfolios and things like mm -hmm. that the same way. And you're talking about Bitcoin. Uh, but, but Bitcoin. Yeah, I know. Yeah. We were going to talk to those, uh, those guys that we didn't get on the podcast yet. I, I actually yeah. need to follow up with those guys. I didn't quite understand what they're doing. Yeah, and I'm not even talking. Yeah, so I'm not even talking about those guys. I'm just talking in general because, like, right now, the banks don't even look at it as an asset. So if you're trying to to provo uh, prove net worth to the banks and you're like well yeah here's you know i have all this stuff here's bitcoin well they don't even consider that mm. i guess if you yeah, have like, the etf in canada they maybe would the etf now now the u.s etfs well i guess the but if you're self custodying it i guess they just laugh at you still yeah so which is probably the same as they did with they do with gold because i guess they can't prove yeah. it if, if anyone's holding like gold coins or something if they have a hundred grand in gold coins mm -hmm. then how are they gonna prove that to the bank to take a picture yeah I mean, the thing is it's an open ledger you could give somebody an address and they could check but i it. think that the day i think I, I don't know i just feel like this i mean like if, if this continues down this path i feel like the day's going to come where people are going to recognize that if they can prove it somehow you, you know mm -hmm. like yeah but i'm like why would they not recognize it if it starts if it continues to play out the way it's played out it was, I guess it now. threats the existing financial system to its core. Yeah, but if you have the ETF, yeah, then they, they would recognize that because that's in your RSP. The ETF you for just, sure. You just give them the RSP. Just give the dollar value yeah. of like, hey, I got these ETF shares of Bitcoin. Like yeah. it's kind of bullshitty, but you have this dollar amount there. Yeah. But then does that in the future, do you, are you able to leverage against it? 
That for sure. Because I always go back to that example that you you shared um, about Larry Ellison taking out a big credit line mm-hmm. and never know, selling his stock. Yeah, never selling his Oracle stock, where he took a credit line against it for a billion dollars. When I was there, I never forget. And the balance on it always blew me away. It was like eight hundred and fifty million dollar balance on his billion dollar credit yeah. line. <laughs> but he's got the income to pay it off. So you need this income component. So even if you leverage something like that, or even I mean, even if you leverage properties, you need the income to continue to pay it off. So you, that's why you need. But it doesn't have to be real estate. Maybe it can be a business. Maybe it's a paycheck. Like whatever it is for you. But you need that income component to then offset what you're, if you're able to hold assets and then leverage those assets for other things that you want to then yeah. give that back mm-hmm. versus just selling the asset. It still seems like the better way to me. I can't figure out a better way than that. It seems to make more like sense. Like hold the asset, use some, put something against the asset to leverage the asset, get some fiat. Yeah, dollar sometimes you got to trade in one asset for another and stuff like sure. that. Sure. You, you know, but, but, but overall, just in, you know, theoretically, the, with assets and income, that's, I just, it doesn't, it makes yeah. mo- the most sense. And, and more than any flipping diversified this, that, oh God. And they, like it's like. And you have direct uh, ownership uh, of the assets in this. So Mike, I think that to, going back to your question, I think to me, it's like the most beautiful combo and then just use the percentage to what you prefer. So if you're like so heavy on real estate, they're like, maybe it's like 90% real estate, 10% Bitcoin. Or if you're the other way, you know, 10% real estate, 90%, or well, whatever it is, throttle it. Mm-hmm. But to me, you're playing in both worlds at the same time and you're maximizing both worlds in that approach. I don't know, I really like it. Mm-hmm. I think it gives you the best opportunity going forward and you just can adjust your percentage as needed. And then right? every so often- And having liquid cash. You do need the first bucket that we yeah. always talk about. You need liquid cash for emergencies, maintenance of your own properties, rental properties, life, groceries, that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, I think it depends where you are in your life too, because if you're maybe a young couple that's just starting out having kids and you want a few kids, maybe you want a couple properties where you're leveraging those properties down the road where they're rentals now, but maybe in the future they're for your son or your daughter totally. as well. Because if you don't, like, what are they going to be able to get? when they're 25. Yeah, real estate's like required, like shelter is a need, Mm -hmm. right? It'll just be interesting to see if it goes to a utility value of the property and how soon that happens or does it take like decades for that to happen, you know? Yeah, and we're getting long now, so we, we can end it. But this is what gets interesting to me is because I, I with 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 it going to the utility values, I was thinking about this and, and how Jeff Booth, you know, talks about the deflationary forces and things like that. And then I'm like, but in our world, even if you remove the, the, the kind of financialization premium that's been put on real estate, with the inflation pressures, like are, is the land of, is the price of land going to come? So if labor doesn't come down or land doesn't come down, but I guess technology replaces some la- labor, we still need the raw materials mm-hmm. for real estate. So I, I've just went recently, just today, actually, like right before this, I've, I was playing this all out of my head. I'm like, how does this all impact that? Even if you remove that premium, because there's all those other factors mm-hmm. and it would go back down to land price still, the government getting their take to, because they take a, a bunch that, that adds to the cost cost of, of new properties as well. So just, I need to, I need to dwell on that one a little bit longer. Um, but it's just recently what I've been thinking about, kind of what you've been talking about and what, how would that, pl- what that potentially could look like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, yeah. It's, if remember that example, the, the Blue Mountain House, what it cost in Bitcoin, just when we bought it versus what it costs in Bitcoin now. Yeah, I'm just the talking. dollar price of, the, I guess the, we're going back to the beginning, we talked about measuring stick. If you use Bitcoin to measure things, in Bitcoin terms, it's going to cost less and less Bitcoin. It yeah. has been. I'm, t- I'm talking specifically in dollar terms. Yeah, like it. I wanted, mm-hmm. I'm trying to figure out what it looks like in dollar terms. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. Yeah. I agree with mm-hmm. that. I'm just, I'm like, I'm looking at a different angle. I tried to poke holes in it too, on the real estate side and, uh, rates are trumping everything right now, trumping immigration. Yeah. But when you look at the fact that, you know, the immigration that we do bring into Canada is not construction immigration. That was in the 60s with the Portuguese, the Italians. Mm-hmm. Greeks came in, they did restaurants and banquet halls. Hey, you're leaving um, the creations out, man. You're leaving <laughs> the creations out. Drywall, drywall. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, the immigration that we bring now is predominantly like IT, food and hospitality, transportation. Um, yeah, we need those skills of actually building housing. <laughs> and we need the architects to draw those uh, plans. And then we have uh, the, the, the trades that uh, are folding up shop right now because they're not busy. Um, all this stuff is going to take a while to get online. So with, you know, we have all this immigration coming in, but not the supply being built. And that supply is going to take years. And not, it, yeah. And then layer on a younger generation that looks at more and more taxes in this country. And if you're going to be an entrepreneur and start a business... Does Canada look like the place that you might set up shop if you have the ability to move to another place and yeah. set up shop? Well, it can't. Right now, no, but it can. 
it can the potential might exist yeah but w- mm. but if i was a young person right now i'm not sure i would look at canada as the place i'm going to start a new business yeah why would i no you're at the right. tax rate that, here I mean, that, the- that changes that could change six months to six months because you can go someplace else and that you know there there's i agree with you i'm just saying that that that's more fluid than some other things which will lead to more tenants and the desire not to own a home if you want to be that fluid and be able to work remotely and stuff sure. like that mm-hmm. you know when i was when i was getting lunch is on that part about uh about uh construction workers and things like that because i think we 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 don't give them enough credit in, you know for for years it's always been like oh well you're gonna work a trade you know i'm going to mm-hmm. university and it's like you know i'm highbrowing you because i'm going to university and you're just oh you're gonna be a plumber right it's like i just it's always bugged me i just didn't get it there was um and this is, and I know this is going to surprise people too, because I'm saying it's a young girl, but yeah, it surprised me because you don't see as many females in the, in the trade. Mm-hmm. There was a young girl when I was at Subway, there was a young girl with another guy. They were there all covered in, I guess it was either paint or taping mud or they had like stone stuff, pl- could be plaster or something, all covered in, in stuff as contractors. And I think they worked for like service master or something. And I was like, man, that is so, she yeah. had a DeWalt jacket on. I'm like, that's mm-hmm. so cool. Like I was, I thought it was so cool that I was like, they, they, like a, a younger, They're productive gen- people, younger, <laughs> well, yeah, younger generation. And I know there's a lack of female because I've read reports on it, like lack of females going into that sector too. And she's doing her thing. And I'm like, that, I, I don't know, for some reason I was like, it, I was like, it gave me hope. Yeah, That was it. She doesn't know it, but she gave me hope today. <laughs> we'll it. end on that hope. <laughs> yeah. And the hope that the Buffalo Bills win the Super Bowl this year and the Toronto Maple Leafs no, no, win no, the Stanley no, Cup. Niners. Niners. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for doing this, Mike. Mike, by the way, before, uh, as we wrap, just the name of your book that we continues to get great feedback. Can you share it? Yeah, it's Wealth Won't Wait, not to be confused with Wealth Can't Wait. It's Wealth Oh, is there another wait. book? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but completely different, different books. Yeah, Wealth Won't Wait on Amazon, Audible, and Paperback. Yeah, cool, man. Thanks for taking the time sit down mike appreciate it man thanks guys hey thanks for tuning in you can find every new episode of the your life your term show on all the major streaming platforms so spotify itunes google play and if you'd like to get free copies of some of the books that we've put together like these right here or some of the reports that we've put together like these right here you can find all of those at www.rockstarinnercircle.com that's www.rockstarinnercircle.com That's it for now. Until next time, your life, your terms.